Warm greetings from CNS. Welcome everyone to this very special webinar in the lead up to this year's World Cancer Day. According to the World Health Organization, at least one third of all cancer cases are preventable. Prevention offers the most cost effective and long term strategy for the control of cancer. But despite this knowledge, we are failing to prevent so many avoidable cancers. As we all know, governments of our countries have committed to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs as they are known by 2030. And one of these goals is to reduce the burden of non-communicable diseases by one third. Cancer is one of such non-communicable disease. Are cancer deaths declining fast enough to meet the SDGs by 2030? Let us listen to and interact with a panel of experts to understand what can be done to rein in the preventable cancer cases at least. Without any further delay, let me request our first panelist, Anne Jones, Senior Tobacco Control Expert with the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease. She is also the former CEO of ASH Australia and a recipient of the Medal of the Order of Australia Award. Let us hear from her about the nexus between tobacco and cancer. Over to you, Anne. So World Cancer Day uh, is a really a good time for us all to reflect and reassess how far we have come in relation to cancer and tobacco and what are the challenges that we are facing today. Um, unfortunately, we can't say we have a cure for cancer, uh, but what we can say is that 20% of all cancer is preventable because these are the cancers uh, that are caused by tobacco. Uh, but we can only prevent these cancers if we act now. Uh, so cancer and tobacco, it's a very big topic and I want to just focus a little bit on why sustainable development needs unity and commitment to tackle tobacco. So next slide. Next slide please. So what we know from our global surveillance systems is that cancer is a leading cause of death and disease worldwide. Uh, it's, there are some staggering figures uh, that we have to try and absorb here because 8.2 million people die each year from cancer and what's perhaps more alarming is that there are 14 million new cases each year and those cases are expected to increase 70% over the next two decades. Next slide please. But perhaps the most staggering statistic is that 20% of all cancer is preventable because these are cancer deaths that are caused by tobacco use. And of course it's not just lung cancer uh, that is caused by tobacco use, it increases the risk of 14 different types of cancers. So just about every organ in the body uh, is, is uh, susceptible to uh, cancer if people use tobacco. And I'm not even mentioning uh, heart disease here, so we would have more deaths uh, if we were looking also at heart disease caused by smoking. And of course, uh, in recent times, non-communicable diseases have uh, received a lot of attention. Uh, and of course, the leading risk factor for non-communicable diseases is tobacco because that will kill 38 million people per annum, uh, with most of those deaths occurring in low to middle income countries. Next slide, please. So what is the size of the tobacco problem uh, that is causing so much preventable cancer and suffering? Well, nearly one billion people in the world are using tobacco every day, with 80% of those people uh, living and residing and working in low to middle income countries. Uh, if we're looking at uh, what are the deaths, what are the death, uh, what's the toll from tobacco, we have over 6 million people dying each year from tobacco use and the majority are not dying at the end of their lives, they're dying in their most productive years which is 
between 30 and 69 years of age. And if we look at what's happening with children, and they are the new users of tobacco because they're targeted specifically by the tobacco industry, over 12% of boys smoke and 7% of girls. And this is a global uh, statistic uh, that comes from the world's largest public health surveillance system, which looks at um, uh, over 2 million students. They survey over 2 million students and 11,000 schools participate uh, in this grand uh, surveillance system. Next slide, thank you. And of course, tobacco causes a lot of harm to others. If we look at exposure to secondhand smoke, uh, we know again from our surveillance system that it is responsible for at least 600,000 deaths each year amongst non-smokers. And what is really alarming about uh, this figure of uh, secondhand smoke harm to non-smokers is that nearly half of these deaths occur amongst women and over a quarter amongst children under the age of five. Next slide. And the link between tobacco and poverty has been well established because tobacco use is highest amongst poor people and it's a fundamental barrier for uh, development. If you look at the costs, uh, and there have been some major studies recently, the costs are increasing and they're uh, having a disproportionate burden uh, amongst the low to middle income countries. Next slide. So what are the costs of tobacco? We know that they're extremely high uh, and there's a new study on the economics of tobacco and tobacco control that have only just come out uh, this year which has estimated the costs at over one trillion US dollars per annum. And these are costs that relate to healthcare, lost productivity and other uh, direct and indirect costs. And these uh, costs which could be prevented are rising alarmingly in low to middle income countries. And yet if you look at what are the costs of delivering the four best buys in tobacco control measures, um, they work out at approximately 11 cents per capita. So there's a huge contrast between uh, the extremely high and preventable costs of tobacco, over one trillion dollars uh, US per annum, and yet the very small cost per capita of 11 cents if we uh, had more governments delivering on the four best buys for tobacco control measures. Next slide, please. So it's extraordinary that the vector for this global tobacco epidemic is a very powerful industry, a transnational industry, the tobacco industry, using very aggressive acquisition and marketing strategies to expand their use, which is shifting from uh, the high income countries, the rich countries, uh, to low and middle income countries, where a lot of systems and laws are not yet in place to protect their own populations. We know from uh, a lot of experiences right around the globe that a major industry tactic is their interference in health policies, in trade policies and fiscal policies in particular uh, where their goal is to keep tobacco tax reforms uh, either not happening or extremely weak as well as uh, to ensure that health strategies are underfunded so that there's no uh, you know, impact on the profits that they are making from expanding into these countries. Next slide. So with so much evidence, uh, and particularly um, evidence about health harm from the past 100 years, and all of the surveillance uh, that we have in place uh, to assess the impact of tobacco on cancer and as well as heart disease, why haven't we achieved more? And I think the simple answer is that progress has been delayed by tobacco industry interference at every level in every country as well as a slow response time uh, by governments even though they're facing rising healthcare costs which could be preventable, uh, certainly the ones caused by tobacco and also the lost opportunities uh, that they uh, are, are bypassing to invest in sustainable development. Next slide please. 
So we do know what to do. We've known what to do for many years. Uh, and fortunately, we have the World Health Organization's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which is a legally binding treaty. It's just passed its 10th anniversary. Uh, it's been ratified now by 180 countries over the past decade. Uh, and these countries have committed themselves to implementing a package of evidence-based measures. And these measures are proven again and again to be very effective. And they include 100% um, smoke-free laws, graphic health warnings on tobacco products, comprehensive bans on tobacco advertising, promotion and sponsorship, protecting health policies from tobacco industry interference, and last but not least, raising uh, tobacco taxes, as this is widely regarded by economists and, and experts in tobacco tax as the single most effective policy to reduce tobacco use. Next slide. So if we know what to do, um, what is what do we really need uh, to see happen um, as urgently as possible? Uh, we do need stronger unity and commitment across all nations. Uh, all those nations that have ratified the treaty uh, is really needed to raise tobacco taxes as well as within those reforms a mechanism for sustainable funding of health. Because governments do have the power uh, to raise tobacco taxes which are still too low in so many uh, low to middle income countries and to use those taxes to raise revenue and to spend some of it on uh, the funding that's so urgently needed uh, for health programs. We can prevent at least 20% if not more of all cancer deaths if we engage with governments, the media and civil society to put health first and ahead of the interests of the tobacco industry. Next slide please. So for the first time in history, we now have a treaty that is supported by 180 governments. We have more active partners than we've had in the past. We have some uh, strong funders, particularly Bloomberg Initiative and uh, the Gates Foundation. And we have many new tools uh, that we do need now for countries to help countries deliver the sort of sustainable de development they would like to have to prevent the cancers that they are facing and to save millions of lives. Uh, and here are just two examples of uh, some of the tools that uh, have been developed by the Union to um, aid countries in their fight against cancer and to uh, ensure that they are doing everything possible to save lives. Uh, one is the Index of Tobacco Control Sustainability, which is a tool to measure uh, the sustainability of national tobacco control programs. And this tool helps to identify the gaps and then to close those gaps. Um, there's also a toolkit for guiding governments on preventing tobacco industry interference. Uh, this is based on the Framework Convention's Article 5.3, uh, which uh, sets out to uh, help governments prevent interference. So just two examples of uh, the many resources that are now available to help countries in their fight uh, against cancer and tobacco. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. That was Anne Jones, Senior Tobacco Control Expert with the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease. As we know, World Cancer Day is on 4th of February. Let us now hear from our next panelist, Dr. Navneet Singh. Dr. Singh, a lung cancer expert, is Associate Professor at the Pulmonary Medicine Department, PGI-MER. Also, Secretary of the Indian Society for Study of Lung Cancer and a member of International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer, which is more commonly known as IASLC. Over to you, Dr. Singh. The burden of lung cancer, it is the most common cancer for both gender combined, approximately 13% of all new can cancers. It is the most common cancer in men, one out of every six cancers. It is the fourth most frequent in women. And importantly, it is the most common cause of death from cancer. One out of five deaths, cancer-related deaths are because of lung cancer. It is also the second most common cause of death from cancer in women, even though uh, incidence-wise it is lower down. Importantly, majority of the cases now occur in the developing countries and it has a high fatality 
that means the ratio of mortality to incidence is 0.87 which means that five out of six people diagnosed with this disease will die because of this disease and this lack of variability in survival is seen in both the developed and the developing countries now if you look at this slide it shows you the trends in incidence of lung cancer and as you can see that in the developed countries uh, in the above the us canada start the there is a decline which is seen but in india this is still going up similarly if you look for females it is sort of plateaued up but in india it is still going up and that is the worrying part similarly if you compare the developed countries and the developing countries what you can see for females it looks more or less flat for males it is more apparent in developed countries it is going down but in developing countries it is going up and this is very recent data even if you look at indian epidemiology lung cancer is is the most common one of the most common cancers 11% and in terms of mortality it is even more shocking almost 14% now there has been an increase in adenocarcinoma globally and this has been because of the changes in the smoking behavior of the population changes in cigarette composition and manufacturing basically filter cigarettes and lower content of tar and nicotine and there is also a tendency for cigarette smoke inhaled more deeply as compared to ed which is prevalent in india however when we looked at our data we found that this was not true we found that our center square one and uh, the possible reasons for this was that it was because b was the most common smoking product and not cigarette and like cigarette making there has been no change in the process of bd manufacturing which is primarily a cottage industry on top of this quit rates for smoke in india continue to be less than 10% and therefore smoking be it in india be it in other parts of asia africa or anywhere in the world is the most important cause for cancer lung cancer it accounts for 80% of more of these cases however amongst other smokers a passive smoking or also called as environmental tobacco smoke exposure is an important cause in addition to other occupational and environmental exposures interaction is also uh, seen with the genetic susceptibility factors <laughs> in fact if you look at the different types of lung cancer tobacco smoking influences the type also with the highest for squamous small cell and the lowest for adenocarcinoma another important thing is that tobacco also influences the clinical presentation so if, when we looked at our data and we divided patients into heavy smokers liver smokers as you can see among heavy smokers it was only 2% females and never smokers it was 52% females similarly the age was almost 61 years average in heavy smokers but only 55 years in never smokers there was also a significant distribution in the histological type the stage of the disease amongst this three different groups and these were all very significant statistic uh i'll touch upon environmental tobacco smoke it is basically is also previously called as passive smoking the problem with documentation of ets exposure is that it is not easy to document them the same way as you can do for active tobacco smoking indoor air pollution is something which is very important because it implies smoke generated by fire pits and stoves due to biomass fuels and or coal and in india and other developing countries it is very important because they use uh, biomass fuels or coal and if you don't have good ventilation you have uh, the total number of years cooking years has been high you can get significant exposures because of this now i like to show you this slide which show you the geographical diversity within india so this were four papers which were published at the same time in 2012 this was from our center 650 patients and you had similar papers from east of asia west of asia south of asia there are several differences in the age percentage of males percentage of smokers the histological type and the stage now if you look at the clinical presentation this is one of the typical chest radiographs one of the frightening chest radiographs for a patient the problem is lung cancer has a common clinical presentation like other lung cough breathlessness hemoptysis or blood in sputum and loss of weight loss of appetite and you can see these things in 
lot of pulmonary infections like tuberculosis or fungal infections and even non infectious even in uh, countries like india differentiating lung cancer from tuberculosis is very difficult and the problem is that uh, people can get get treated as tuberculosis for a varying period of time and it is only when they don't respond to this anti tubercular treatment are they sent or referred for uh, work up for alternate diagnosis and this leads to delay in the diagnosis of lung cancer now there are certain clinical features i won't do going to details which can kind of give you some pointers towards whether it is lung cancer or pulmonary tuberculosis similarly you have some features on the chest radiograph for example these lesions are more seen in tuberculosis these lesions are more in lung cancer even on ct scan you can have certain features which differentiate the two for example the above two panels a and b signify uh, malignancy while panel c and d signify tuberculosis similarly a top two panels a and b are suggestive of malignancy and c is suggestive of tuberculosis but the bottom line is that differentiating lung cancer tuberculosis or other lung diseases is not possible on the basis of the clinical features or on the basis of radiology or x ray or anything and that is why you have to have a biopsy or an fnac prior to initiating treatment it is must 100% of cases you can do any fnac or biopsy from any site which is most easily accessible you can use a variety of procedures for that it is not necessary that you have to sample the metastatic site Uh, or the primary site any site which is very easy and before you getting doing proper staging is very very important once you have confirmed the diagnosis and a minimum is a contrast enhancing scan of the thorax and the upper abdomen which could include the liver and adrenals because this often gives a clue to where the disease has spread uh now treatment is primarily based upon two things the type of the tumor which is the histology the extent of spread of tumor which is the stage and the functional ability which is the performance status but in today's era we are practicing personalized therapy or tailor made treatments and we have to look at several other things uh, like the wishes of the patient reimbursement insurance and lot of molecular profile the current five pillars for management are surgery chemotherapy radiation therapy targeted therapy and immunotherapy and uh, based upon the stage you can have cases which are very easily resectable clearly all of this is resectable above the uh, green line beyond the red line i think is not resectable and in between is the gray area now traditional management approaches have tried to differentiate small cell versus non small cell and you have different roles for each of these five pillars in each of them but the thing is and even among non small cell based upon the stage whether you should do surgery chemotherapy or radiotherapy so that over the years lung cancer has evolved from being just differentiating non small cell and small cell to differentiating the types and so there is the molecular era and we need to look at egfr alk and ros1 in all adenocarcinomas in fact this is a very important slide because it shows you that even this egfr prevalence varies widely across the world with being very high prevalence in china japan korea lowest here in north america and india is intermediate in fact we found that our prevalence is close to 20% for egfr and almost 8% for alk the good thing is if you have female non smoker adenocarcinoma she has a 41% chance of being egfr positive and some chance of being alk positive and they don't occur together which would mean that a female adenocarcinoma non smoker 55% would be either egfr or alk positive and for this you just need to give one drug a day and of course more of this is available on the internet lastly i will just like to you give you an overview of how you treat so you look at you confirm the diagnosis by a biopsy or fnac look at the histological type if it is small cell they go in there is usually very little role for surgery it's all chemo radiation if it is non small cell based upon the stage you will either give surgery followed by chemo or combination of chemo and radiation for 3 stage 3 if it's stage 3b and 4 then you have to look at the subtype in the subtype you have to look at adenocarcinoma you will test for egfr and alk if they are positive you just give them one targeted drug a day for squamous it is more or less just chemotherapy and uh, when whenever all of these progress these new immunotherapy drugs which come in 
Lastly, this is a multidisciplinary management approach. You require the services of all colleagues from different departments. And I think I will leave it at this because this is the most important message, stopping smoking and multidisciplinary management. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Singh. We were listening to the lung cancer specialist from India, Dr. Singh, who is associate professor at the pulmonary medicine department, PGI MER. And last but not the least, we have with us a senior educationist, Neeta Malik, who has a lived experiential knowledge of the disease. Having fought and conquered breast cancer with remarkable courage, she is an inspiration to all of us. Over to the Gutsi Neeta. When you are diagnosed with cancer, it is very difficult to take the news immediately. You might hear the words but may not be able to absorb them and believe them. Cancer is a serious disease and a lot of fear is associated with it. One immediately thinks that life is ending soon. With these thoughts and feelings, life becomes stressful. Feeling and emotions change every day. Some days are low and on other days you might be totally positive. I was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 53 and my first reaction was, Lord, I don't want to leave the world so early. I desperately wanted to survive. Since the treatment began soon after, I had little time to think. My doctor suggested an immediate surgery. I had implicit faith in my doctor and so my husband and I immediately agreed to it. After the initial tests of FNAC, biopsy, ultrasound, etc., I had to undergo a surgery. I am a friendly person, so I did not shy away from telling my friends and dear ones what I was going through. My family and friends came to visit me at the hospital and at home after the surgery. Their visit lifted my spirits and willpower. After the surgery, a schedule for chemotherapy was given to me. I had to go through six cycles of chemotherapy after every 21 days. This part of the treatment was the most difficult one. Intravenous administration of the drug was done. It took me an entire day at the hospital. On returning home at night, I would be exhausted. Feeling tired, not being able to eat properly and generally feeling uneasy is normal for the first day. Next two days, I had nausea and muscle pain. By the second chemotherapy cycle, I had lost all hair. This was traumatic really. More than anything, loss of hair is what I could not deal with. Looking good is a normal part of women's life. Chemotherapy made my skin dark, my nails black and of course with no hair one can imagine what it would look like. It is easy to say that things will improve soon. But the time that you have to pass like this feels like a lifetime. Gradually, I did get over it. I found emotional support in my work. I am a teacher and all through my treatment, I continued my job. I remember the first time when I faced my class, which is composed of a bunch of teenagers. My heartbeat was so fast, I could almost hear it. I was waiting for their reaction. They all sat so silent that it was almost eerie. I gathered courage and gave them a talk on uncertainty of life. Dealing with the emotions and beliefs of other people about cancer can also be challenging. People closest to you, like my husband, my children, my mother, worried about losing me. My friends were not sure what to say to me when they learned I had cancer. Some had the courage to support me, others did not. They also feared they might offend me by saying something insensitive. Half the battle is won if you feel positive and have the right attitude. In, case, in my case, my work kept me busy. I continued my job all through my treatment. I did show some strength and it was not difficult because I knew I would be well soon. I reminded myself often this was only life interrupted, not life stopped. A cancer diagnosis changes your life and the lives of people who love you. The emotional impact can be felt for years to come. Emotional support from your dear ones helps in your recovery for sure. The fact that my husband was always with me for every appointment, test or surgery did help. My colleagues at school encouraged me every day. Many prayed for me insistently. Many kept me in their prayers every morning. Just as cancer treatment affects your physical health, it affects the way you think. One starts valuing life. One starts valuing friends. You start acknowledging what you have and not grudge the have-nots. You keep saying things could have been worse. 
and that was that I was lucky. I sure was lucky and am well today. I do hope one day cancer will only be a sun sign. Thanks Nita for being with us on the show today and igniting that much needed spark of courage in women around the globe. Joining us now is a participant from Mumbai, India who happens to be Nita's twin sister and a cancer survivor twice over. Welcome to this webinar, Rita. So in 1975, we lost our father to cancer, prostate cancer, and we saw how our mother struggled with three children and with the husband passed away. So they, and there is also a family history of cancer in our family because with some uh, aunties and cousins who had cancer. In 2006, I was diagnosed of breast cancer and Nita thought that I was going to die. So she cried all night and for next few years, she was always in her days that oh, I hope she will be fine and all. That. In 2013, as Nita, in Nita's words, she felt a lump in her right breast and a twitching in that lump. And she went to the doctors. Doctors said everything is fine. They did some tests and uh, but she forced them that, no, you must do the tests because uh, because of the family history and uh, the the lump was diagnosed as positive for breast cancer and the best part was that it was uh, detected at a very very early stage and this was kind of a self diagnosis for her the greatest shock was that in the same year 2013 7 years from my treatment i was diagnosed of a second primary in sternum bone so at the same time, almost uh, a few days here and there, both of, of our sisters, we had cancer. She was going through her treatment in Lucknow and I was in Ahmedabad and I was going to different doctors and deciding about the fact that what should be done now. So uh, what we want to say is that cancer has strengthened the bond between us. Cancer could not take away our smiles. It was more difficult for me to accept her diagnosis than my own relapse. And uh, the, for Nita, it was a state of denial. She was shattered. She had a tough time accepting the facts. She was worried about her, like she always thought that, oh, am I going to die? I don't want to die so soon, so early in life. And she was frustrated. Time to time, it was like getting sleeplessness and all. But slowly, she decided that she got through this denial phase and she accepted the facts that, yes, it is positive for breast cancer and she has to go through the treatment. So she had a very positive attitude towards the treatment. Her doctors were good. She got a very good family support. And she decided it was a firm decision that cancer shall not win. She will win over cancer. She maintained good diet, regular exercises, walks, and she shared all her thoughts with her friends and family, which is very important. And uh, she, when once, first time when she went to the class she, uh, for teaching, and all through her treatment and post-treatment, she has been teaching. So first time during her chemo, when she went to the class, the stu students stood like there in silence and they didn't know what to say. They were all also, you know, very shocked that their favorite teacher was getting the treatment. So she turned the whole scenario and started talking about changes in life, how things change, life changes at a certain point for almost everyone. And what she feels is that early detection saves lives. If there's a lump anywhere in the body, it should be diagnosed at the earliest and removed. This is possible only if we go for regular medical checkups and screening tests. And her take home message is that accept your cancer, do not have negative approach to life, regular breast self-examination helps, do not neglect any symptoms of breast cancer, Eat healthy, follow a hobby, and distract yourself from ne negative thoughts. Never ever give up. 
And from, from my part, I want to say that I started this charitable trust called Race to Rain in Cancer with a friend, Rashmi Kapoor, who was also a breast cancer. She, but she passed away. She has not survived. And we registered in 2012. And uh, since then, I have been working for this charitable trust. And uh, in the next few days, on 12th of February, we are going to hold a cancer awareness walkathon in Mumbai on uh, the theme We Can, I Can, which is the theme of World Cancer Day, World Cancer Month. India, uh, in uh, 2017, 18th and 19th November, we are also going to hold an international conference at India Habitat Center, New Delhi. And this is all what I would like to say is that and at the end, I'd like to add a few words by Robert Schuler. Live each day at a time. There will never be another now. I'll make the most of today. There'll never be another me. I'll make the most of myself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rita, for sharing this such an inspiring story of your life and Nita. And I just want you to give say one thing which you would like to see change in the this world of cancer, particularly maybe where women are concerned or otherwise, from your experience? Yeah, I like? particularly for women, it should be that uh, we should not hide our cancer. We should not be, there should no, not be any taboo about talking about breast cancer or cervical cancer or anything like that. So I have seen women like I met one woman who, who had breast cancer. Her, her breast was almost, it had gone inside, it become like a cup. But she did not tell even her husband about it, although she was a working woman. And she died, of course. So uh, early detection is what I would like to emphasize on. And sharing. We should tell about this. We should not hesitate to visit the doctors. And we should also have full trust in our doctors. The personal stories of these two courageous women, along with the very informative presentations of Dr. Jones and Dr. Singh, reiterate our belief in the We Can, I Can slogan of this year's World Cancer Day. We now open for question and answer session. Participants, please keep sending your questions using the chat function or by clicking on the request to speak button. Rita, there is a yeah. question for you. That yeah. what what sh what should be the treatment modalities? Should there be improved treatment modalities, or what were the treatment toxicities you fa faced, and what were the side effects of treatments which you faced, which you think need to improve with uh, newer treatment options in future? Uh, for chemotherapy, you mean to say? Yes. Yes. Well, I faced all those uh, common side effects like nausea, vomiting, all that. And uh, I think it, it has improved with the latest drugs. It has improved okay. a lot. Nita did not face anything. OK. OK. And, so, uh, and most, uh, the, if we take more fruits, I mean, depending on the kind of fruit, and uh, some Ayurvedic treatment, that helps a lot. OK. Do you think there is need for more uh, uh, such uh, groups of uh, cancer survivors uh, to be able to counsel others and help others? Do you think there oh, are yes. enough such groups in India or Definitely. we need more groups? We need to spread the word about cancer awareness a lot. We need to remove the myths about cancer from the society. There's a lot that has to be done in India. And the fact that people don't want to talk about this mm. in India is also has to be removed. <laughs> okay. Tell us something more about this conference which you are going to have in Delhi. What is the thematic focus of the yeah. conference? Uh, if the focus of conference is on in Cancer Today, Roadmap for Tomorrow. This is the theme. And it is being held with Indian so, uh, Science Congress Association and National Media 
center, media center, there's a group, there's an NGO. With them, we are doing MICRD. Okay. So we are invited uh, guests and speakers from, I mean, we already have the speakers from Canada, UK, Malaysia. There is one question for you from uh, Ashok Ram Sarup, that what are the what are some of the challenges you faced over the years or after the treatment was over? Any any specific challenges you faced? See, initially during first seven years, when like uh, when the treatment was fine, and then um, I didn't face too many challenges because I am an outdoor person and I was doing a lot of physical exercises and swimming and all that. So. I was quite happy with my life. But then this the second time when I had the second pr the primary in sternum bone, that was quite shattering. So at that time, after seven years of uh, the diagnosis and ho whole treatment, when you get diagnosed once again, it's really difficult to handle it. Uh, that was difficult and but then, and most difficult challenge for me was when we had registered the trust and my partner, uh, Rashmi Kapoor, she passed away within a few months. Though I knew that she will not survive, it, she had this cancer had spread in her body. So then I was totally left totally alone. And I thought that the charitable trust will die and it will not continue. But slowly, uh, some students joined and I gave some volunteer training workshops and it came up. So it's been only four years since we have been working. My gratitude to our esteemed panelists and participants for being with us today on this special webinar in the lead up to World Cancer Day 2017. As always, we will be sending the recording of the webinar, which is on YouTube, to all of you. Have a good day.